Welcome to the Simplicity of the Gospel brought to you by the Pegwell Community Church of Christ Church in Barbados. Today is Sunday, the 22nd of May, uh, 2022. We're here again tonight to, to challenge your faith, to prepare you. The Lord sent somebody ahead to prepare for the famine that was coming. Uh, there was supposed to be seven years of plenty. And in that time of plenty, you were supposed to gather corn and all kinds of stuff because seven lean years were coming. And I can tell you that lean years are coming. I'm not guessing. I see it in the word of God. And at the Pegwell Community Church, we are viewing everything from a biblical worldview. And we see that some difficult times are ahead. As a matter of fact, they have started already. The Bible said there'll be pestilences. We had one that turned the entire earth upside down, the world upside down. And when you put an S on that, pestilences, you can understand what's happening. And now the monkeypox is on its way. You never can tell what's going to happen with that. But there are going to be pestilences. And when you talk about, uh, about famines, listen, I want you to pray. I was going to do it earlier, but I changed my mind. Uh, our government has just, um, they're in some discussions with the government of Guyana to feed us in the next year or two. What they're going to do is that they're going to do a lot of produce in Guyana. They have a lot of land. Guyana is so big. So they're going to be growing a whole lot of food in Guyana. They're going to be shipping up to Barbados. Up by Carl Williams and Lears, they're going to build a big, massive building where they're going to house everything there. And that is going to be a shipment point. So they're coming to Barbados. Then they can ship from Barbados to St. Vincent. They can ship to all the other islands. But this massive thing up there, they're supposed to start up very shortly. I want you to pray about that, that it will succeed. Because I guarantee you that when food is not coming from America, because they need the same food right now. And when food is not coming across the Atlantic Ocean, we'll be able to get something coming up to the Caribbean Sea. Uh, we could get some yams and potatoes. Did you see yesterday how they were on display and all the plantains and everything in Guyana? So I think it is a very excellent idea. And I want you to be praying about it, that it would not fail. Now, I know they're also going to criticize it, but we have to get something to eat. Is that okay with you? Amen. Now, let me start off by giving you this. I, I, I started off with what a mighty God we serve. And I said to you that we've become ineffective as a people of God, because we do not see God for who he is. So we live substandard lives. We live uh, in sickness and disease. And, and we, there's a lot of unemployment. The gifts are not working. The food is not evident. All sorts of things are happening to us because we are not seeing God for who he is. And this morning, we began to take a small look. And we look, and number one, uh, in Psalm 46, we are not bringing these verses up. But Psalm 46, that God is our refuge and our strength. So we don't have to behave as though we're weak. Because if God is our strength, then we, we are strong. So we look then uh, at Psalm 84 and verse 11, where God said he will not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. God, uh, God will not withhold any good thing. So although we talk about the hard things that are ahead, the difficult times are ahead, we have a God. We've got to know the God that we serve. We look at the fact that, um, that God cannot lie in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. That God cannot lie and he's promised us some things before the foundation of the world. Then we went to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 13 and we see that God is faithful. God is faithful. He's not going to change his mind. All the promises of God are yeah and amen. God never, ever, ever says no to his promises. The promises of God, you find that in, in, um, in Corinthians. Sorry, Corinthians, yes. Then um, we went to Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. And we said the Lord God among us, the Lord God in our midst is mighty. He's even almighty. He will not fail. We have a good one on our side. That if we fall, he will lift us up. Not that he can, but the Bible said that the Lord upholdeth all that fall. If you fall, then don't come to church and be depressed and all that and not worship the Lord because you've fallen. The Bible said when we fall, underneath us are his everlasting arms. We are not going to fall deliberately. Who falls deliberately? They're going to be a foolish person. But if you fall, underneath are his everlasting arms. God in the midst of these mighty. Then we look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. Where the Lord said to Joshua. That the Lord God is with you wheresoever you go. Even on the job where people are giving you trouble. 
the Lord God Almighty is there with you. We've got to know who God is. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, we look at a scripture where it says that God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men call slackness, because he doesn't answer you at the snap of your finger. You think that God has forgotten, or that he's not able, or that he's unconcerned. No, 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 no. God is not slack concerning his promise at all. Whatever promise he makes, he's going to bring it to pass in his own time, number one. And number two, with our cooperation, because there are some promises that depend on you cooperating with God. I just gave you one. The Lord will not withhold any good thing, listen to this, from him that walks uprightly. So we were looking at who God is. Uh, in 2 Samuel 22, 34, we didn't bring this up this morning, but uh, it says things like, for who is God except the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? God is my strength and my power. In Psalm 54 and verse 6, God is my helper. In Psalm 62, verse 7 and 8, God is my strength. God is my rock. God is my refuge. In him will I trust. So we go to the Bible, despite what the world is going to say, despite what the intelligentsia is going to say, I am urging you and I'm belaboring the point. To live according to the Bible. Forget your own opinions and opinions of those who are wells without water. Those who are clothes without water. No, they don't have anything to offer. But we can always look to the word of God. Tonight, then, I want to spend a few minutes because you notice that we have been singing a long time. Uh, I want to spend a few minutes looking at God, our provider. Sometimes you don't have the provision, but look at this text. In, in Zechariah, I think it is. Look at this text. Sometimes it will seem to you as though the money is not there, the food is not there, the health is not there, the peace is not there. But here Habakkuk is saying something that you should, we all should learn. And if we can memorize this verse, it will be so good. Memorize, start memorizing. We're, get, we're going back to Bible boxing. Hey, we're going back to Bible boxing. We're going to go back to some uh, quizzes like we used to do before. We're going back. And at one time you thought that that was a method of tearing up the Bible. But now you realize that's a good method for you to learn the scriptures. So we're going to have some Bible boxing, put some boys against girls or whatever the case may be with some gifts to encourage you to learn. The whole purpose is that we want to get the word of God. In, in, it's amazing how Calypso's come out and within a week all the children know the words you ask them to say John 3 16 they can't we are going to correct that we are going to correct that in this church so make sure that your children come beginning next Sunday and there's a call upon the teachers to make sure that we tell the children this is what the Bible says this is what the Bible says I remember the first time when one of my sons came home from one of the, the upper, the upper the schools and tell me, but daddy, there ain't nothing wrong in life. There ain't nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. It's how you see it. I mean, there's nothing wrong. The Bible tells us a lot of things are wrong. The Bible tells us thou shalt not commit adultery if you do it, you're wrong. The Bible said thou shalt not murder if you do it, you're wrong. Huh? The Bible said thou shalt not do a whole lot of stuff, which if you do, you are wrong. But your children will be taught, there's nothing wrong. It's the, it's the perspective you look at it from. That is not looking at it from a biblical perspective and so I don't want you to, to um, get involved in that or get your children involved. I, I, I was supposed to ask again, uh, to say, sorry, that we want to go back to reading Bible stories to your children. I said children, teenagers, maybe not, but to the children. I remember my wife used to do that with the, with the children. That was never my role. To get a book and read. Why am I saying all this? Because we want to go back to a biblical base. Because, you know, a lot of stuff out there sounds real good, you know, real good. When somebody tells you, I believe in a flat earth, I'm a flat earther. When the, when the Bible said that the Lord sits on the circle of the earth, huh? and the Bible indicates that, you know, that, that the earth is, is, and not only that, you can see pictures taken by, by satellite, people circling the earth and people saying that they're, they're, they're fake. They are, they're, they're pictures that are doctored. That's when you want to believe something, you just believe what you want to believe. I understand now that there are about 26, about 50 
about 50 different things you could call human beings now. And, and my dear, we had Mr., Miss, and Mrs. Now you have about 50 things that you could call people. And that is what's being fed into the, into the hearts of your children. And we are not conquering it. We've got to conquer it in church. So don't always come to church expecting to dance. Don't come to church expecting all the time for you, you for the word of God to minister to you. Think of other people in church that the word of God got to minister to as well. Don't always come to church expecting to hear your songs, the ones that you like. What about the others, other songs that will minister to other people? And from now on, don't get upset if we digress in the midst of a sermon to tell the little children something. Right in the midst of a Sunday morning sermon. Okay? Don't get upset if we do that. Everybody, the cake is big enough for everybody to get a slice. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, this is a case here where there's dire need in the family. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, because when you see blossom, you know we can get some figs, figs later on. But although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. It's a hard, hard situation, not a fruit. You can't even get a mango, you can't get a pear, you can't get a papaw. He says, the labor of the olive shall fail. You spent all your time working on the olive plant. And now perhaps what happened is not given any olives. The labor of the olive shall fail. The fields that you work so hard in shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fall. Maybe you have some, some people, who, some butchers who stole them and sell them in the market. But you don't have any flocks, they're cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herds and salt. In other words, let's update that. It says you go to the cupboard, your cupboard is like Mother Hubbard's cupboard. There's nothing in the cupboard. There's nothing to go to the supermarket with. You can't go outside and wring off the neck of a chicken because we, we are too sophisticated for that these days. You, there's nothing to eat and your mouth is getting away at the side and the children are looking up at you calling for mommy. But there's nothing, nothing, nothing. Look at the next verse, however. This is what I want you to do. And that's what we are training you to do. He said, yet, I will rejoice. My salvation is not based on food. Job said, I esteem the word of God higher than my necessary food. He said, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Let's read that. By the way, that word rejoice here in this text, in another translation says, jump up. I will jump up, and the word joy means spin around. So you can read it this way. I will jump up, and I will spin around in the Lord. I'm not going to come to church with a long face. I'm not going to let everybody know that I didn't have breakfast this morning. There's nothing in the cupboard. I don't see any way of getting anything. But I am going to rejoice in the Lord. So all of our service should be what you call good. There should not be a dead service with people looking at you as though, you know, God is dead. Because... Even Paul said to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I reiterate, rejoice. Let's see this text here, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. In some of the more modern translation, because I'm telling you, I'm talking about God our provider tonight. And God will provide for you. Listen to this. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. There is no room at this time for depression. There are fathers and mothers, husbands and wives. There are children in the house that are looking for you for sustenance. They're looking to you for faith. They're looking to you for support. And so... Is required of you that you lift yourself up above that standard. God provides. The Lord is our provider. God provides for us, although we are oftentimes unaware that he's doing it. Take, for example, I hear every now and again somebody in church say, I have, I have a bad knee. Well, that should not stop me from coming to church, but it does. And yesterday, a lady in New York put a bill up in front of the telephone for me to see the bill. Huh? She has just had a knee replacement. That knee replacement that was done two days ago cost 110,000 US dollars. 
That is 220,000 Bajan, almost quarter million dollars. But when you go to the hospital and stay in the hospital for three or four weeks and get a surgery like that and don't pay a cent, then you don't understand how you are blessed. You complain about the nurses. You complain when they don't bathe you in time. They complain when they don't, you, you don't get your special food. But you don't have to realize that you just saved $220,000 if you got a knee replacement. I said sometimes we do not recognize that God is actually, and this is not hearsay. I actually saw the bill with my own eyes. I actually saw the bill. Uh, uh, so we don't understand. I just said sometimes we are blessed and we don't recognize. Sometimes we don't understand what is happening. So the, prison, the provisions of God are for people. Um, the provision of God for people is a common theme throughout the Bible. And I want you to live that way like God will provide. Every day you're not going to see it. You're not going to see your cupboard full. You're not always going to see money on the bank. You're not always going to be feeling well. But we said that our God is mighty. Our God is able. We ended up this morning by saying with God nothing shall be impossible. He's given us certain things that we should do. The simplicity of the gospel.